were waiting for you, I was just about to explain to everyone my own personal journey with self-love. I've had a really tricky journey with self-love. It's something that I've not really been able to achieve myself uh, until very recently I've been able to embark on a genuine journey of self-love. I had an eating disorder for 20 years and I've really struggled with self-hatred, not just around my aesthetics. And it's also so important for me to make sure that people understand that eating disorders aren't always aesthetic Based. They can be for many different reasons, uh, like psychological, emotional reasons, uh, ways of trying to control your body, etc. Um, but for me, I struggled really badly, and I have found this kind of very commercialised wave of self-love and, and positivity that I'm supposed to have really overwhelming um, as someone who struggles really badly, and I felt as though it's like a further pressure it's something else that I have to fail at, is achieving this perfect sense of, of love and acceptance. And so where I've been trying to get to with my movement of my way is just a place of neutrality, where we can at least just be okay with ourselves as a realistic foundation before we try and get all the way up to love. And so I guess part of the reason I wanted to talk to you today for anyone who's joining right now is because I wanted some practical tips and, and realistic conversation around the self-love issues we have in this world. So what is self-love to you? I think self-love is recognition and appreciation of our inherent value. It's not something that we earn, it's something that we recognize. Um, I think it's just choosing to show up for ourselves. It's using our voice, it's acknowledging our needs and trying to fulfill them. It might mean having those difficult conversations, setting those boundaries. I don't think self-love is always pleasant per se, um, and I definitely don't think that it's accidental. I think it's very much intentional, and it's almost like a lifestyle that we have rather than something that we accomplish and then just kind of keep. I agree. I feel like it's in our nature to love ourselves because, and I talk, about, I talk about this so much, but when we're babies, we're perfect, right? We don't have any issues with ourselves. We know how to advocate for ourselves. When we're, when we're hungry, when we're tired, when we're lonely, when we want a cuddle, when we need to piss, we let people know. We're very, very vocal about that. And we, we don't uh, notice differences between ourselves and other races or notice other people's body types. Like we're so open to love and acceptance. And I feel like that's the best version of ourselves. And that kind of gets taken away from us the more we ingest societal structures or standards or oppressive structures or media and and so you're right it is a it is an active job to keep working towards actually finding finding that that love within yourself finding it again i feel as though my journey is trying to get back to the innocent loving accepting person i was when i was born oh i love Do you feel that. the same way yeah, oh, absolutely. I think of the confidence I had as like a really young child and the self-acceptance and just <laughs> the audacity of the way I would show up. And, and, and I miss that, and I love that so much, and I, I want that boldness back. Um, and I think I, I lost it definitely along the way. It's something I, you know, we talk about the inner child and a lot of time it's in a negative connotation, like the wounded inner child. But I think an inner child is something beautiful and tapping into that part of our inner child, that strength, um, that creativity, that empowerment is, is wonderful. Mm -hmm. And so what do you think self-love is represented as currently in mainstream society? Um, as self-care. <laughs> <laughs> which is like which is a face mask which is a face mask and like a nice little <laughs> massage and uh feeling beautiful and i don't think there's anything wrong with a face mask or a massage or feeling no. beautiful um at all actually these are all wonderful things but i, I think that it takes away what self-love really is and again it's something that we accomplish and worst of all it's something that we purchase a hundred percent so i want to talk to you a little bit about the self-love crisis and the findings of the Body Shop Self-Love Index because you are an expert and you're also so well versed on this. Would you tell us where we're at? Yeah, I mean, the research that the Body Shop did was so incredible and um, the Self-Love Index was, I think, conducted 22,000 22, individuals, wow, I can't speak, um, over, um, I think it was like 20 countries. The research is just really, really amazing. And what it showed was that we are in a self-love crisis. Um, and I don't mean that lightly. I mean, one in two women 
said that they resonate more with self-doubt than self-love and that you know six in ten women um, talked about wishing they had more self-respect more respect for themselves and that's that's so powerful these findings really indicate what we've done as a society to one another and and what it, what it's like to to really struggle to accept ourselves and love ourselves as women and do you find it is disproportionately impacting women the self-love crisis Actually, the research was really interesting on that, where um, I don't think there was a really big difference um, mm -hmm. in gender. Um, and um, I, at first I was kind of, I don't know, surprised, but then not surprised, because I looked at my clinic and I went, absolutely, um, men also really struggle with self-love. Um, I think that they might not have the same amount of pressure, but they are also not allowed to really talk about it. So it's just the same coin from a, you know, yeah whatever the expression is. <laughs> um, and, and it's really fascinating to, to have men in my clinic I, because I pre predominantly work with women. And the, the struggle is so so the same. And I think self-love is a, is a human struggle. A hundred percent. And I think sometimes where we see the disparity come up is that men are, are better educated in how to advocate for themselves. So they are, they are better skilled at rising above the self-doubt that they may feel internally, which is similar to women's, but they're given more tools and more encouragement to actually uh, yeah. work past that, I think. And that's why we can sometimes think it disproportionately impacts women because it's, it's sometimes our, whether or not we put ourselves forward for that. I talk a lot about you know, uh, us being very, very careful about what we say to ourselves in the mirror and would you ever say those things to a friend right. or to a woman or a person that you care about would you ever tell them that they're too fat for love or they're too old to try out a new adventure or they are too um i don't know unattractive for a job or for a relationship or for someone to want to have sex with them you would never say any of these things to someone you love and care about you wouldn't even think them if you're a good person <laughs> and so and, and yet here we are saying these things daily to ourselves hourly sometimes I've said I've said things to myself that I would you know I don't even really know you and if I if I saw someone say those things to you I would I'd fight them I'd lose but you'd know I was I was trying. You got my back. I, I really appreciate it. It's true. The crap I say to myself is just, it's horrifying. 100%. So what about, you know, what about during this moment of the pandemic where we have people who have been stuck inside, uh, if they are not an essential worker, they have not been able to, they have not left their houses. I don't mean not been able to as if it is lucky to have to be on the front line. Um, but I'm saying that people have been stuck inside. They have not had events to go out to or, or work to really turn up at. Everyone's been working over Zoom. Uh, people have been living in sweatpants. I know that this is one of the first times I've been dressed from the waist down, because normally everything else I do is I just nickel jeans. up. <laughs> yeah, 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 I can't believe it. I'm still wearing, a, it's like a sequin sweatsuit still. So I've got like drawstring pants. And sneakers because I'm I'm just not ready Slippers. to give up the game. Yeah, but people are no longer wearing as much makeup, or they had to, you know, they stopped going to hair salons and dyeing their hair, etc. You know, people stopped having their nails done. Um, and do you think that there has been, and and yet at the same, and so I think that that's been really good for some people to be able to come to terms with their with their just sort of everyday face again, and not having to put on the facade for the outside world. But at the same time. I've never seen a bigger influx on social media of trying to infiltrate our brains and shame us about the way that we look, shame us about our bodies, try and encourage us to become an expert in, in being beauticians by the end of this. Like They want you to have a post-pandemic body. Now that we're yeah. finding out that different countries are going to open up over the summer, there are all these memes about what are you going to look like when the world opens up again. It's the new revenge body, essentially. So with the onslaught of social media, but at the same time the opportunity for us to get to know ourselves again, almost as, as if we did when we were kids, where are we at according to the self-love index? As in the impact of the pandemic, um, I think yeah. it's, quite, um, it's quite fascinating. I think what the pandemic did was amplify the relationship the individual already had with themselves. What I mean by that is a lot of women found liberation um, by, not, by shedding some of those expectations and just being, to, being able to show up the way they want to show up. And it really gave them time to reflect on who they are and how they want to reprioritize the way they use their time and, and 
their relationships and to journal more and all this other stuff and it's really enhanced their journey and I would say self-love and studies do show that for some women it, it hasn't changed their relationship or it was actually positive but then on the other spectrum women that already struggled with self-esteem uh, when they were thrown into the pandemic their self-esteem actually worsened um, and their self-love worsened. I think part of it is because um, the struggle with self-esteem is often that we try to outsource it Something that we can't do, but we think that we can. And so we get a bunch of validation that we then mistake for self-esteem and we mistake for self-love. Um, mm -hmm. And so what has happened is individuals that get this sort of validation um, from the outside world were no longer able to do that. They were kind of stuck inside and because the validation wasn't coming from within, um, their self-esteem actually dropped because the little self-esteem that they were getting was now taken away. So what do you do if you find yourself in that situation? If someone's watching this live right now mm -hmm. and, and that's what they're struggling with, what are your kind of practical tips out of that? Oh, uh, yeah, great. Thanks, Jamila. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> um, I think self-esteem um, is really grounded in that recognition, as I said. And I think what's important is to get to know yourself. It's really difficult, and I say this all the time, it's so difficult to love someone you don't know. You can kind of appreciate them, maybe, but um, I think for a lot of people that struggle with self-esteem, what I've found in my prior practice is that they really struggle with knowing who they are. And it's as basic as, how do I feel? What are my needs? Um, what, what is my body doing? How is it reacting? And so I think to start off that journey really slowly, really easily, is be really gracious and just get really curious about yourself. Try to understand yourself. You don't need to accept yourself. You don't need to love yourself, but just try to understand who you are as a person. I think that's one of the best tips I can give for self-esteem. I love that sentence that you can't love someone that you don't know. And it's so true that so few of us get to know each other. And, and it's so important that all of us understand where that comes from, which is that, you know, I believe that we are kept in a deliberate sense of chaos mm, uh, yeah. in order to take us as far away from ourselves as possible because unhappy people are more likely to buy more products or try to live different lifestyles or try to look like a completely different person you know commercialism capitalism wants to it wants to shame you into buying something that will fix what they have told you it's broken and i think one of the reasons that you and i don't sign up with a lot of uh, brands and the reason that i think we both resonated with the body shop is that they have never been about that they've never been about trying to shame you into buying something trying to make you feel bad about themselves they've always had as far as i know unedited photographs and i used to see more racial diversity in their advertising campaigns and i would see paws and and goosebumps and and real human beings in their campaigns and and they never felt like they were trying to make you feel as though your mm. your happiness had to be something that was topical maybe they'd give you things that would make you smell like nature or make your skin feel softer predominantly but I never felt as though I was being pressured to mask who I was or what I looked like by the company but I feel as though so many companies do and, and I think that if we can understand that, it's easier for us to rebel against that, to realize that you know, we're not failing if we don't feel comfortable with ourselves. We're not failing if we don't know who we are. We're not failing if we're giving in to all the capitalism and commercialism and we want to do all of the things to ourselves that, that people are telling us we should. We are collectively as a generation kind of victims of a system that benefits a small percentage of human beings in massive ways because they make a lot of money off of our insecurities. And my I Weigh movement is all about completely discarding the way that you look and more just, uh, and I think that's probably why the body shop and I lined up is that we're all about who you are on the inside. Like, what are you going to remember back on your deathbed about yourself? Mm -hmm. who, who do you want to look back on? What, what memories do you want to make? It's not going to be what you weighed every single day. It's going to be who you were, what you did, how you made people feel, what your contributions were to society, all the things that you failed at. I failed at so many things, but I've, I'm still working through overcoming those failures and, and figuring these things out. And I think that that is a cool and beautiful part of me. I weigh the sum of all my parts. And so is that something that you feel is helpful? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think we're overstimulated. And I do think part of it is really intentional. And 
you know, we always talk about mental health and self-love and why, why it's, I mean, our society doesn't really nurture self-love or self-awareness really. I think the foundation of, of self-love is self-awareness, as I said, and um, I think our society as a whole prevents people from doing that because we're so overstimulated and we want to belong so, so strongly, which is, uh, by the way, such a beautiful, normal human thing to want to do. Um, but if we don't belong to ourselves first, um, that's when the problem can ensue. And so I, I think, you know, you brought up such amazing points, like when you are on your deathbed, what are you going to remember? Um, and, I, and I think I always talk to my clients about legacy, about impact. What is your impact? Um, and I think as long as we're aligned with that impact, I actually think that contributes to our source of self-love. Um, when we do something meaningful, that is self-love. And we can't really differentiate the two. And when you talk about being overstimulated, are you partially talking about social media? Yeah, you know, absolutely. Do you, have, do you have information you can give us on the impact that has had on yeah. our ability to love ourselves yes i can yes i do um oh so, <laughs> how convenient that. <laughs> asking all the right questions now so um it was really fascinating to see how individuals that use quite a bit of social media feel twice um twice as much as if you know they have social support emotional support they actually perceive that they have more social support than individuals that don't use social media so that's kind of cool. Um, it's interesting I, um, that the findings found that. I think it's important for people to keep in mind that connecting with someone over social media and connecting with someone on a one-on-one -on -one basis or outside of social media, like a letter or a FaceTime or like a social distance walk is different. But I do think that uh, the findings do highlight something cool that you know social media does kind of nurture that sense of emotional support. However- I also just want to, just sorry, yeah. I just want to jump in on that and just also remind people that this might be the first time that a lot of people in the world have had to rely on social media to feel connected to of the course. world outside of them, but there are people who live with physical disabilities that because the world is so inaccessible to them, they've always, or as long as at least social media has existed, they've, they've had to rely on that in order to just feel seen or to see others or to connect with others. So I just really want to always take an opportunity to remind people of that so they understand that, that there are so many great powers to social media and that also it's such an important tool for those that often we are, you know, we are prone to forget. Oh, anyway, okay. sorry. I no, I mean, I love that. And even the advocacy pieces and the activist movements and people got to connect to communities that really resonate with them. I mean, there's so many wonderful things where people felt emotionally supported um, during the pandemic, just being able to connect about how difficult it was to go through a pandemic. So absolutely. And so that's what the research shows. But it also shows that heavy users of social media have lower levels of self-esteem and self-love. Um, and I think it comes from our research, what you can tell or what, what it kind of states is that it comes from comparison. Social media um, users find it really difficult not to compare themselves. Um, and, and I get that. I mean, you see <laughs> photoshopped perfect images and it's not even just about the body. I think it's also just about people's lives. They just seem so perfect. Um, and in comparison, we can't, you know, we can't win we can't win with a perfect image we can't win with a perfectly curated vlog about someone's life and i i think that you know in my private practice i would have uh clients that go you know i spent an x amount of time on an x amount of platform and i felt like absolute shit and then i just cried and and i get that it's because it's not realistic and we're always disappointed we walk away feeling a bit resentful <laughs> and we can feel like a failure, like we don't deserve the love because we're not embodying whatever we're seeing. And so I think that's one thing that research really showed was that comparison piece and the lower self-esteem as a result of social media. Yeah. I am, I'm always banging on and on about editing photographs and how dangerous I think I it, it is. And, and I, you know, and I think sometimes people think I might be virtue signaling because I'm talking about the fact that I don't edit my photos. But I don't edit my photos not just because I think that that would mean that I'm complicit in setting up uh, unrealistic beauty ideals for the people that follow me, which I think is a, a, a thing that sucks and that my peers shouldn't do. And I'm ashamed of them when they do uh, and angry with them even though I understand that it, you know they are also victims of the same culture and society we with bigger platforms have a uh, responsibility to be more 
responsible. Um, but I also don't do it for me because when my image used to be photoshopped or edited uh, on magazines and billboards, when I would ask for it not to be, they would just be like, no, sorry. And they would make my skin lighter and they would make my nose smaller and my eyes bigger and my teeth whiter and my boobs bigger and my waist smaller and my legs longer and I would look like a completely different person in the magazine or on the billboard. And that would mess with my head. Never mind just the girls who are looking at that image thinking, oh, I'll never look like that. I was having to deal with the fact that I was then going to go out and see my friends or bump into people on the street and I couldn't match that image. And that to me is the toxicity of editing images, is that then there's this kind of embarrassment that comes from the lie that you have told. And you've told that lie because you've been pressured into feeling like you have to tell that lie. That's not your fault. But do it for yourself. Do it so that it's not a completely different person that you're standing in front of when you're looking in the mirror at night, you know, putting your moisturiser on. Uh, I want you to recognise that person and not hate or resent that person. We've seen so many statistics of, of you know, and surgeons coming out and saying that, cosmetic plastic surgeons coming out saying that uh, people are bringing in their edited photographs. Teenagers even are bringing in edited photographs of themselves and saying, can you make me look like this? That's the impact of editing your photographs. So get used to the unedited version, not just for everyone else. Do it for you. And it has ch honestly changed my relationship with my face, with aging, with my pores, with my body um, over the last five or six years since I've put a, a, a real foot down about it. No, that, that's great. The filters are, I mean, I, I think I tried my first filter like a couple months ago. I don't I, and it was shocking. First of all, I was like, wow, wouldn't it be great? And then I realized, you know, I was sending a text to someone and I, I was going to send a funny picture and I almost put a filter on just because I, I wasn't feeling it. And I was like, what the hell am I doing? Like, and it's so funny from trying it once. I was like, well, this can help the lighting a little bit. <laughs> like This can kind of soften the blow in my mind. And I, I was really shocked but by that response it's like you know i should know better and obviously that's a ridiculous thing to say to myself back to that negative self-talk but i i think it was it's so easy to just use the little help and and it makes you feel pretty in that moment but as you said the reason not to do it i think primarily is for yourself because then you will look in the mirror and go wow i don't look like that and i i can't accept the way that i look no, you're, you're setting yourself up with a pedestal to fall off of every single day, every time you look in any kind of reflective surface. Also, please don't edit your friend's photographs without even asking. That sends them a really bad message about themselves. It makes them think, you know, you think you're doing them a favour, but actually you're just telling them explicitly that they're not good enough. And also, please, 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 please don't edit photographs of your children. It's a really weird thing to do. I know I sound judgmental, but I disapprove of it massively. You're then not giving them a shot from the very start to accept yeah. the person that they are. And that's not your place to impose your issues that you've ingested from society onto them. And what are we modeling? I mean, if we think about, you know, the next generation of women, if we Photoshop every picture and use a, f a filter every time, or we have daughters, what are we teaching them? And I think the way that we speak about our bodies in front of them, the way that we show up in public, um, the way that we show up on so there's like a fly. The way that we show up on social media is so important because it's not just we're modeling behavior to future generations, and I think we need to not forget that. A hundred percent. So, what do you? What impact would you say the beauty industry has had on our self love? And what I mean, do we need I, to change about it? I think that um, the research has shown the negative impact that you know the things we talked about: airbrushing, photoshops, unrealistic claims you know, detox, all that kind of... Also, always using teenagers, even for brands yeah. that can only be sold to adults or only for adults. I think that's really problematic, you know, having 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 16-year-olds running, you know, walking down the runway in, in clothes that are really being sold to people much older than them. And they don't... They're then having to compare what those clothes will look like on a 14-year-old's frame or what that makeup will look like on a 16-year-old's face. And we even, we even edit anti-aging cream. Like, how is this legal? Yeah, no, it's such a good point. And I think another thing that the study showed in the self-love index was it's not just the Photoshop and all that stuff that's quite damaging. It's also 
the type of beauty, the conventional beauty that we that we show, and we're not very diverse. And, and it's you know the, the beauty industry picks one thing that they deem beautiful, and then they show it, and that becomes mainstream. And then anyone that does not fit into that mold feels like shit. And so I think that. Um, Diversity is so so important because the research showed that it's not just the Photoshop It's also just the conventional beauty that's that's being displayed repeatedly. That's causing the damage A hundred percent and again, it's just something that I find so it's something that I find so frustrating and and in particular for women I'm not saying it only happens for women because there's definitely increased pressure for for men and the way they're supposed to look and we're seeing that also on social media um, where they're all supposed to look sort of like, you know, superheroes. Um, but women are given a kind of a new prescription of the beauty standard, of the global beauty standard. Every, like, five to ten years, we're told, now you have to have this. Yeah. And if it looks like some of us are starting to achieve that, then they move the goalpost again to keep us constantly feeling dissatisfied. You know, when I was a teenager, it was, it was called heroin chic, where we were supposed to look like the only thing we ate or consumed was heroin, and so therefore we were, you know, emaciated. And now they've kind of morphed that into a kind of very skinny but athletic frame in the noughties, and now the athletic frame's kind of gone out, the kind of Britney body's gone out, and now they want very big breasts and a teeny tiny waist and a big bottom but very skinny arms and skinny legs and a thin face and yet a face that never ages which is not science I mean, because actually if the thinner your face is the more likely you are going to show a sign of time and gravity and that's not a bad thing it's just they're setting literal impossible standards specifically I'd say or more so for women it, it's impossible, and I, as you said, they move the goalposts. You you can't win when when it's constantly changing. And the thing is, what it does is it doesn't let you enjoy your body. Who mm. cares <laughs> if you don't have the tiny waist and the big booty? Like it's okay. It's it's really like at the end of the day, when you're 80, you, as you said, you're probably not gonna go on your deathbed and be like, oh, if only. <laughs> Yeah, it's, you know, and I, and I think there's so much emphasis where society is saying your worth comes from this. And this is the big issue with self-love is because they're telling you self-love is something that's quite external. And it is just not. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's people that fit those molds that still don't love themselves. This is something we need to remember. We see people walking down the street, we go, wow, she's beautiful, she looks great. She must love herself. She must be confident. This is just not true. There is, I would argue, supermodels that don't necessarily have the healthiest relationships with themselves. Um, I've worked with professional athletes that didn't necessarily love themselves. And so it's not about appearance, and this is something we really, we need to dispel this myth. 100%, and it's also like really important for us to, to highlight to everyone that this isn't something that we're highlighting the importance of just for you, just for the impact your self-love will have on you. It'll change the way that you are able to love everyone else. It'll change the way that you are able to show up intentionally for the people that you love, the people you care about. It'll change how much time and space and energy you have to innovate and be creative and maybe study better at school or work yeah. harder at your job or, or have the, the energy to find a job that you love even more. It's so, it's so important that you understand that this is us trying to kind of, you know, build you from the inside all the way out so it can resonate around the world. If we could all embrace more self-love, right, then we would end up in a much healthier society, I think. So much of the ways that we lash out at other people are often projections of our own self-judgment or self-hatred. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. I love that point so much. I think relationships we have with others are gen generally manifestations of the relationship we have with ourselves. And we talk about, you know, global change and, and all this stuff. And and I just don't think it's really going to happen unless there's interchange. It's, if people, imagine a world where people, not loved, respected themselves and yeah. respected other humans. Our world would be a different place. And I think that's, you bring up such a good point. It does start within. I think when we change, we change part of the whole. Therefore, the whole will never be the same. We change the script of society. We change the contract we have with one another. And all of that begins with how we view ourselves and then how we will position ourselves as a consequence. 
and, and I can say from personal experience that since embracing more body neutrality and since working towards my self-respect and love of my, of my life rather than of myself, does that make sense? Like the first place that I have been able to get to is gratitude. So rather than, oh, I just love myself, I'm so obsessed with myself, I'm so great. Uh, which would be great to get to, by the way. That It'd would be, be fabulous. That is an amazing end goal. Um, but I'm kind of at, I'm at a place of respecting the life that I have. And I'm hoping that after the last year, all of us feel a little bit more respect towards our bodies in what they are able to do. Like the fact that, A, we've now you know, we're no longer taking them for granted. We realise we have these unbelievably complicated, amazing immune systems that are keeping us alive. Yeah, and then we also are in, you know, we have these bodies that take us from A to B. And so looking at my body as this this machinery, as this, uh, this incredible product of engineering has really helped change the way that I look at my physicality. And, and also learning to see myself as so much more than a billboard for other, a walking billboard for other people, be those family members, friends, people in the street, strangers, people who follow me online. I have become more, I've become a better person, a better girlfriend, a better friend, uh, a, a better businesswoman. I'm, I'm better, more successful at my career for having just let go of these things. Like, you know, you and I have spoken before about, imagine if we had an app that could tell us how many minutes a day we spend thinking about how we could improve ourselves, whether that's on the inside or out. Like, how much time we spend hating and picking ourselves apart. Imagine. That would be so confrontational. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like denial <laughs> is something we all, like, bathe in. <laughs> you know, it, it helps uh, us cope. <laughs> and that would just be a really... I'd feel really called out for that. And I I think my part of my self journey was calling myself out. And obviously I, I don't do it consistently, but it's really being more aware of those moments where I am just constantly picking things that need to be different, trying to make things different. Um, and you know what? My time would probably be better spent if I read an extra book. <laughs> I yeah, felt like hung indeed. out with people I loved, right? Like, like it's it's time management. I think one of the first times we spoke, you, were, you talked about time management and how much time women waste doing this stuff and and I, I, that really stuck with me because think about all the self-growth that you can have if you, if you use that time for something else yeah i mean i i uh when i was working at the good place i refused to come in any earlier than the boys on my show because of the fact that i uh i didn't want to wake up earlier than them because then i felt as though i wouldn't have slept well and i wouldn't be able to be funny and i wouldn't be friendly on set and i wouldn't be able to work a 14 or 16 hour day on less sleep, just because I'm a girl, therefore I need more preening. So I did my own makeup on the show most of the time and just worked out a way to get it all done in 25 minutes, just like the boys did, so that we would have an even opportunity to, to deliver on camera, because the most important thing is that I'm there as a comedian, not as a some sort of supermodel. Um, OK, so Tara Noe asks, what's your advice for people who are struggling with self-love? Yeah. Great question. <laughs> um, I think we talked about it. I think people are struggling with self-love. The one thing I want to say, it's not something you fail at. It's not an achievement. It's it's a process. Um, be gentle, be curious, and really get to know yourself from how you feel to what you need to how other people are making you feel. Surround yourself with a really amazing support system. I think in a society that thrives and feeds off our insecurity and our self-rejection, I think it's so important to surround ourselves with people that genuinely value us and can help us do the same. And so although self-love is something that we can outsource, I think we can do it in a community. It's something that we can still get support for. Um, and then boundaries. I mean, I preach about this all the time on my Instagram. <laughs> I, I think you need to also show yourself that you love yourself. Self-love is not just a thought or a feeling, it's an action. And boundaries are such a wonderful way to not only show yourself that you res respect who you are and your needs, um, but it's also just a way to help you define who you are um, and help you have healthier relationships with other people. And I, I, I think it's the most wonderful thing, most wonderful way to show ourselves um, that we're worthy, worthy of our time, worthy our bodies are worthy, our mind is worthy. It's, it's just so, when I think self-love, I always think boundaries. Set those boundaries. 
I was going to say regarding boundaries that when it comes to social media, be very careful about what you're looking for and looking oh, yeah. at. You know, remember that we have complete control over what it is that we see if we don't click on that dangerous explore button on Instagram. <laughs> you know, you can curate what goes into, what, yeah. you know, what reaches your brain. I used to follow a bunch of, uh, you know, con- conventionally attractive supermodels and actresses and lifestyle influencers who, when I would get off my phone, I would feel like shit about my life, about my relationship, about my hair, about my clothes. And I realized at one point, I don't have to put myself through this. Life as a woman is hard enough in this world. Life as any gender is hard enough. There's enough up against us that I don't have to voluntarily opt in to low self, to lowering my self-esteem. So I unfollowed a lot of them, and then I muted the ones that I didn't want anyone to know I had unfollowed. Um, so you'll just never know who they are. Uh, and now my timeline is just activists and influencers or brands that I think uphold the standards that I actually want to see in the world. We have all the power. We control the market. We get to decide which brands or which people are powerful. So take that power for yourself and don't let FOMO force you to uh, look at things that are damaging you. I feel when I get off my timeline of what I've curated, I feel like I've always learned something or I've laughed or I, I feel like a better person for it. Do you do, you do the same? Are you oh quite God. careful with that? Yeah, and I mean, I'm so careful. I mostly just follow other therapists and there's only so much intrigue I can have. And I think part of that is also, it really limits the time. I think obviously curating your feed to be something that nurtures you and is something that you need, but also just how much time are you actually spending on social media? Um, and for me, one way I really cut on that is just, you know, finding content that's educational, but I don't want to sit there for three hours being educated on Instagram. So it, it really, it's really helped. But I used to follow a wide variety. And as you said, I, I would walk away being like, oh, wow, I should try her makeup. Or like, maybe if I wore my shirt that way, my waist would look smaller. And I would have all these saved in a little like style, fashion, whatever, corner of Instagram. And then I've just deleted all that because why? It's not benefiting me and I realized it was hurting me and I um, I need to take care of myself and I think that's an active part of loving who you are. A hundred percent. We were talking earlier in this live, uh, for anyone who's just joined, about the inner bully, the self-critic and uh, HA2310 has asked, I don't think <laughs> that's their full name, um, <laughs> how can we stop self-sabotaging when it comes to self-love? Yeah, I, I think the the inner dialogue is so crucial for this. Um, first task is being aware that you speak to yourself all day, every day. Like, <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thought, but we do communicate with ourselves all the time and we're not aware of it. And then the next step is being aware of what we're saying and something I make my clients do and I do for myself, which sounds really like quirky, but it's, um, I apologize. I don't just go, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I go, okay, Sarah, no, <laughs> apologize to yourself because you don't deserve to be treated that way. And so I'll go, okay, I'm really sorry that I called you dumb, or I'm really sorry that I lashed out or said, oh my God, you're so silly, stop talking or whatever it was. Yeah, and I would just apologize and then I would reframe to go, what was I actually trying to say? Because oftentimes self-criticism is actually just insecurity or it's a wound or it's a trigger and I think speaking more authentically to myself of like, hey, I'm feeling a bit insecure right now and I don't really know how to handle it, maybe I need to ground a bit more, is really the message I was trying to convey to myself instead of, you're dumb, please stop talking. Um, and so I think I do the like awareness, apology, reframe. I think that's great. And I, I learned about two things, rat and cat. Rat is repetitive automatic thought, which can be uh, you know, positive or negative, but I think more often negative from what we've seen in some of the self-love index findings from the Body Shop's research. Um, but, uh, and also cat, which is constructive automatic thought. And so that is you replacing the repetitive with the constructive. And what this person told me is that words have authority over thought. You can interrupt any thought pattern by speaking out loud. Mm -hmm. And so you can stop that repetitive automatic thought when you find it the way that Sarah is just, you know, giving examples of. And and literally interrupt that thought, call it out, maybe apologize as Sarah does to herself, um, and then 
reframe it and try that one again in your head until it, and do it so often that it becomes a pattern. Because I don't know about you, but I found that once I'd found my inner bully's voice, once I'd heard it, I couldn't unhear it. Oh, you just have to yeah. look for it. You just have to look for it. And I think it's something that I've really worked on the last several years, probably five years. Um, and now I hear it immediately and it shut down so hard, so fast. And that's something I'm actually really proud of because it took years of days, every day being like, nope, I <laughs> to try that again. And it still happens. And, and you know, that's part of just being human and being insecure and being triggered and that's okay. Um, but it's something that becomes hopefully a bit easier over time. For sure. Now, I am someone who's been super open about struggling with my um, mental health, and some people have extra layers of, of, what would I call this, just hills to, or hurdles to jump. And so someone has written in, Lizzie Smith has written in, how can we practice self-love with high anxiety and agoraphobia? Because yeah. I think that's also something that's really interesting, is that it's, there's an extra layer for some of us who struggle with, you know, I've suffered with uh, anxiety disorders for most of my life. And so these things are that little bit harder even for me. What's your advice for that? I know it's a big question. It's a really big question. And the example is really, it really resonates just because, I mean, you know, kind of my story of self-love and it was triggered by massive anxiety and panic attacks that lasted for about a year. And I understand what it means to really struggle to accept that part of yourself um, and I think part of it is not allowing it to consume you um, with mental health I generally you know I don't say I'm very careful with how the client and I word their struggle instead of saying I'm anxious it's I'm struggling with anxiety um, and part of that can be helpful not for everybody but for a lot of people yeah. it is and I think it's understanding that you're more than that that is a part of you that you might grapple with that is a part of you you might need to understand a bit more a part of you might, you might need to learn to accept um, but it's only a part of you and I think that that's beautiful and that can give hope and that can give you so much space to love all the rest of you um, and that can be a, a kind of a, a tip that I give yeah and um, someone just wrote down here, how do we forgive hate and rejection from loved ones? And I want to just jump in and just say that that would fall in line with what Sarah was talking about with boundaries, the importance of boundaries. Dream. If there are people in your life or people at work or people at school who say things that trigger you or make you feel bad about yourself, you have the permission, you have the right. In fact, it is a duty to yourself oh, yes. to start to step back and distance yourself from those people, to advocate for yourself, to give them the opportunity to change, tell them the way that they're talking hurts your feelings and isn't helping you in any way. Um, and if they do not respond with respect, with apology, and with an attempt to become better immediately, then you should distance yourself from those people, even if they are family members. I've had to do that with family members before. I've had to do that with friends before. Do whatever you have to do to protect yourself in a world that is definitely not necessarily at the right level of trying to protect you already. Absolutely. Is that fair to say? I know it's quite extreme advice, but... No, I, I, don't think it's I don't think it's extreme. I think um, the one thing I would kind of add to that is people might not change immediately, um, but you need to see yeah. they're trying to change immediately. <laughs> so, you know, we have to give some, some room for them failing. Yeah. However, that's not, you know, and then five months later, a year later, three years later, they're still doing the same stuff. So, you know, give some room for humanity yet I actually think your advice is so spot on. I think it is our duty to protect ourselves. And um, it's really difficult to love who you are when people around you keep telling you that you're not worthy of love. Mm -hmm. We need to take that really, really seriously. And so it damages the relationship we have with ourselves. And there's nothing I think we should value more than that. And I think there's a lot of misconception about self-love and boundaries being really selfish. And I just don't think that's true. We live in a society where it's like, oh, you sacrificed everything for your partner. Oh my God, you're the most wonderful human. And it's like, oh, you set this boundary to protect yourself. <laughs> like, how dare you? And it's such a double standard and it's absolutely absurd to me. Uh, and I think the m most selfless thing we can do for others is to actually take care of ourselves. It takes away unrealistic expectations off, off of them and the burden because they can't actually do the things you need to do for yourself and then you're actually more open to having healthier relationships with them 
I agree. I agree. I think uh, I think when I'm empty, when I'm running on empty, I have nothing left to give others. No. So, well, thank you so much for coming along and giving us all of this information and your wonderful words of wisdom. Uh, where can people find you and follow you? Oh, thank you so much for having me. I love chatting with you, as always. Um, so you can find me at millennial.therapist on Instagram. That's probably the platform that people might find the most enjoyable. <laughs> I have free content on there. Um, and then my website, which is just my name, sarahkubrick.com. Amazing. And I, and I think everyone can look forward to more and more content coming from you. And if you have enjoyed this IG Live or you didn't manage to see the whole thing, you joined us late, don't worry. We will be posting it in full for everyone to see. And, and also, we really want you guys to join the self-love uprising movement. And that just means starting with one small act of kindness to yourself. So Sarah, what's your self-love uprising act of kindness gonna be? Because our goal is for a million acts of self-love and self-kindness. Yeah, um, so after this live, I'm not gonna replay it in my head <laughs> and find all the things that I said that were not articulated properly. I'm just gonna enjoy my coffee and uh, hang out with these wonderful people in the studio. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I am going to turn off my phone and go and hang out with my puppy. Uh, that is not a euphemism. That's my actual dog. And I'm going to uh, tag, I'm going to put the hashtag self-love uprising so that you can all see that and then hopefully feel inspired to share what you're doing for self-love, whatever that may be, even if it is not safe for work. <laughs> Don't take my advice. I'm a, ter I'm a terrible, terrible person. But uh, loads of love to everyone. Thank you so much for your great questions. Thank you for your lovely comments, all the love hearts. Uh, thank you for being so intentional and thoughtful with the things that you asked Sarah and myself. Um, Sarah, you're a dream. I can't wait to speak to you again soon. I wish the internet was full of more people like you. Oh, thank Bye, you. Bye, everyone. Same. Bye.